you. It's really great to be here, not only representing the PPC community, which is also slightly terrifying and flattering at the same time, but I have a feeling this is kind of like what Miss USA feels like when she goes to the Miss Universe pageant, right? This is how it works. I'm here to talk about Google Shopping, or Shop Till You Drop, and how it will forever be known now in MozCon as the advertising platform that's also a search engine. So a little bit about myself. I am the Vice President of Search Marketing at Portant. That means that I, do, I know about PPC, SEO, social, and content. And I'm formerly a paperclip marketer. That means that uh, when I first started in paperclick, I actually thought it was called paperclip marketing. Go figure. Once I figured out what it was, everything was fine. Um, and this is a picture of me doing kendo, which is a Japanese martial art. And it's what my Twitter handle is based off of. So a lot of people thought it was my maiden name. It's not. It's this thing that I do after work where I hit people for two hours with sticks, and I feel great. <laughs> As I said, I work at Portland Inc. That's here in Seattle, Washington, just in the Smith Tower down the street, eight years and counting. And it does mean that I work with Ian Lurie, who's probably familiar to a few of you. And if you would like to talk, what he, talk about what he's really like, um, I'll be at the bar later. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, that one didn't. That slide broke. Well. Here's what it says. No SEOs were harmed in the making of this presentation. So I did talk to SEOs before I put my outline together and make sure that they didn't fall asleep. Because I realized that, you know, like I said, this is the only PPC speaker at a social uh, con SEO kind of conference. And how this presentation is going to go. So it's shop to you drop. So it's based off of a shopping theme. So you're going to see pictures from images and movies that feature shopping as well as this is the bit.ly link bundle for where you can find all of the links that I will mention throughout the presentation. So you don't have to write any of them down. Just go to the one link, and you'll get them all. I'll have it at the end, too, and we'll tweet it out. So how did we get here? So as Cyrus was talking about, Google Shopping used to be a free platform, essentially. It used to be part of organic search. And Google Shopping does affect you as an SEO, believe it or not. And so if you will mind the terrible pun, we're going to go back to the future first. So these are the five kind of names that have get tossed around with Google Shopping. So the first two, Base and Merchant Center, actually refer to the place where you would upload a product feed. The other four kind of refer more to Google.com's search results or the shopping portal itself. And actually, Google Product Search got it right the first time when they rolled it out with their tagline. It's just searching for stuff to buy, whether or not that's on Google.com or Google.com slash shopping. And one thing I want to make sure that I clarify before we get too into detail here is the way that the terminology works. So Google Shopping is the, 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 the user interface on Google.com slash shopping and, this, and the research results on a Google.com page. A product listing ad, which I'm also going to talk about, is the name of the ad unit that, is a, that appears through Google Shopping. So in October of 2012, the formerly free platform became paid. So what did that do to SEO, besides a lot of crying? Well, first of all, Google made about $500 million out of the gate that holiday season. So they're pr looking pretty good. Um, but what that did, though, for PPC was it, it fundamentally changed the landscape of e-commerce paid search forever. And of course, it took away a large, large piece of search traffic. It also created a huge cost, bet, a cost to these companies, because now they've lost thousands, if not hundreds, if not thousands of visits that they previously were getting for free. So in order to be able to do Google Shopping, it's not just a matter of flipping a switch. Now they have to invest in things like additional platforms, companies, or possibly even bid management. And I'll get into those in detail a little bit as well. So as I promised, mall well, theme, the food court. I know, right? I love Simon Bob. All right. How does it work? And some of the technical difficulties that you'll run into when you go to do Google Shopping. So first and foremost, it's not a matter of just having an AdWords account anymore. The first three are actually required. You have to have those. The fourth one is really required, too. You should have analytics. But these four are what you need to even get started in Google Shopping. But there are some technical difficulties where SEO and PPC overlap. And we can pool our resources to, to get some of these things through. So for example, site speed. You guys have heard a lot about this, I'm sure, over the conference, just in general. But it affects quality score as well. And product listing ads have a quality score, but it's not visible. We just kind of know that it's there. And uh, landing page relevance and site speed and site, uh, site speed affects our, our quality score, which means that we have to pay a higher cost per click. 
This is a picture of Tagman's conversion loss calculator. So it is based on their internal data, but if you would like to see what it's like to uh, play with the slider bars and watch revenue melt off a site as the site speed increases, this is a good way to do it. Card issues. This is the bane of my existence and the number one obstacle to really doing Google Shopping is everybody has a damn stupid snowflake of a cart that's unique that somebody built for them in their backyard or their cousin's brother's friend did it. And then there's some of the bigger platforms that are these huge that have hundreds and hundreds of advertise or hundreds and hundreds of sites on them, but can't do very simple things because of the, the way that they have their cart set up and their site architecture. So how do we get why and why this is such a big deal is because in order to do Google Shopping, you have to be able to pull a clean feed. So a feed is what you extract from your shopping cart. It's the list of all your products. It's your product catalog. And it'll have all of the attributes listed to each of those products. So whether or not that's a product description, a title, a brand, uh, individual, like a SKU number, all that kind of stuff. And each cart will pull something different because they're awesome like that. So pulling a clean feed is really, really important because a lot of times as you pull it, it will mimic site architecture or site navigation. And I think I just saw somebody grimace there because some sites have terrible, terrible navigation and architecture, and you know it. And trying to imagine pulling a feed like that is just a nightmare. So here is an example. I have a WordPress e-commerce site. It's a plugin that I paid for. And this is the message that appears to me when I go into my WordPress interface. This is terrible advice. It is telling me to just go ahead and put my feed into Merchant Center, and everything's going to be OK. This is what the feed looks like when I pull it out. It's, there's tons of information missing. I can't edit it. It's, it's crap, right? And this is why there are entire companies that have built up a huge revenue stream on doing clean feeds. And I will actually get into that a little bit more as well. So what happens when you have product descriptions that don't have any product, don't have a description? This is something I see quite a lot. So if you have a huge SKU catalog, you know, 80,000, 3 million, whatever, there's a good chance that there's probably a product on there that doesn't have a product description, or maybe even hundreds. So what will happen is someone gets the bright idea of creating a fix, well, they'll go in and they'll take the product title, and they'll move it to the description, and then they'll put in some sort of awesome boilerplate text, like, Nike is great. So then you have 100 products that have the same exact text. So they not only have it on your website, but you also have it in your product feed. Or they'll do something like this, where they do two sentences of unique text, and then they'll put in formatting that makes my eyes bleed. You never mind. This is what it's going to look like on Google Shopping. Then we get into the site architecture as well. So this is what the URLs look like for that particular site and what their navigation looks like. If I go and pull a raw feed from here, I can only guess at the horror horrors of what this probably looks like when I pull it out. But I'm willing to bet that a lot of the category designations are missing or misattributed, and then trying to clean those up in general. So sometimes someone will get a great idea, and they'll take the color black on the website, and they'll abbreviate it as BLK. That means that somebody has to go through and clean up every single instance of BLK to black in order for it to be submitted to Google Merchant Center. The more information that you can give Google Merchant Center, the better your feeds is going to do and the better your product listing ads are going to do because then Google doesn't have to guess so much at the queries and the products that they're trying to match up. So you can see why pulling a clean feed is kind of really important. So what this means is that we also need developer help. So if you were going to go in this holiday season and buy a scotch for your web dev team to try and get them to do some changes you've been waiting on, tap your PPC person and see if you can get them to go in on it with you. A couple of other things that we have in common as far as uh, PPC and SEO go. This is new, local inventory ads. So local inventory ads is only in the US, and it is a beta at this time, so it's only got a few advertisers in it. But what happens is if someone searches for a product and it's in stock and in a store nearby you, and they're doing local inventory ads, you're going to see this little red marker. It also works with Google Express, which is the most horrible, awful, quick start AdWords program there is on the planet. Never do it. It also links with Google Places, which I, from what I hear from like last week, it's now called My Places for Business or My Business Google Places, whatever they renamed it this week. So that all links together. But in, an, in a nutshell, Local inventory ads also, uh, they require a separate feed. So when you go to upload into Merchant Center, you're actually going to have two feeds. You're going to have your local inventory feed, and you're going to have your regular feed. And it requires, to be, it requires that it be updated more often. Uh, Google trusted stores. So 
If you're a Google Trusted Store, you get this really cool badge, and then you get to be front and center. And if you're overstock.com, you get to outrank Macy's and Target for something that's really popular and a lot of folks search for, is like, you know, KitchenAid mixers. These are everywhere. But in order to do it, so you have to place a piece of code on your site, and then you have to wait. It could be a minimum of 45 days. It could be longer, because you have to have a certain, number of, a certain amount of data and orders go through in order to jump through all of the hoops that Google requires for you to be a Google Trusted Store. And those hoops are things like order fulfillment time, shipping rates, and return rate. Once you qualify, though, you get this badge, and then you get to stand out on the page. And you can put it on your site just in general, and you can also have it show on your product listing ads and on your and in, uh, sorry, just in your product listing ads. If you're not comfortable with Google having that much information, you, and you got really hit hard with the, the change from, paid to pay, from free to paid, then you might not have any other choice. Besides, as commercial said, they already have all your information anyway, so go for it. So before we go too much further, is it worth it and can you do it? Yes, hell yes, you can do it. It's just a real pain in the ass to set up when, the fir when you first get going. But once you get it going, it actually gets pretty good. So department stores, or I like to call it the targeting, the layering. So how can you do Google Shopping? Or if you're already on Google Shopping, how can you do it without getting eaten by zombies? The first thing you want to remember for when, it, when working with Google Shopping is you're not working with keywords. You're working with attributes. And attributes are the columns in the feed of information that you're giving to Google. And so in the case of Google, you can target by the attributes that they're listed here. So category, brand, item ID, condition, so like new or used, product type, and then custom labels from zero to four. So, you get the, so that's five in total, but Google is unique in that it gives you five custom labels in which you can apply to your feed however you want. Very few other comparison shopping engines do this. So if, let's say that you had a shipping threshold of, let's say, $9.99. Let's say your cost of shipping is $7.99, but you have a bunch of products that are under that. You don't necessarily want to be submitting or bidding to those products the same way that you would for products that qualify for your free shipping offer. So you would just go into your feed, add a column for custom label zero, and then add an identifier. So let's say we'll call it shipping. For every product that's under $7.99 that you would like to have that custom label apply to, just add it to their row. And then when you go into AdWords, you can target that group of products and bid less for it. You can also do this if you want to bid more. So let's say you have a brand that you want to do, or you have a promotion, like you have a 50% off sale, and you want all of the products that are 50% off to get a designation, put them in a new group, and then pump up the bid. This is how you do it. And just to kind of give you some, some visualization, I like pictures, and I got some help with this. You should have seen the one that I made. It looked like, like I, I glue sticks and glitter, I swear. So I got our design team to help me out. So all products is the designation that every single Google Shopping campaign starts with. So you go into AdWords, you create a new campaign, and by default, all products is what it's, all, what, is what it's opted into. Thank you, Google. So what that means is you want your all products bid to be the lowest bid out of all of your bids because of the way that this is going to kind of layer. So you have your top level categories, your subcategories, your ID, and your custom labels. And you can target to any of those depending on how much you want to, to promote a product or group of products or not. So let's say that you had 3 million SKUs. How do you do this without losing your mind? Because if you've ever tried to open an Excel sheet with 3 million SKUs, it doesn't work. So portfolio approach. Not, and then we also, sorry, you want to take it from a portfolio approach, so groups of products, instead of trying to focus on a single product every single time. Maybe you, do have a sing maybe you do have a single product that, is got, that gets huge amounts of traffic, and it's very popular, and you want to bid for it separately. No problem. You can do that with the item ID attribute. But it's those thousands of other products that you're worried about, uh, about either getting out of control, showing the wrong size, showing the wrong um, uh, pack. Like maybe you have a six pack versus an eight pack versus a 12 pack, and you want the eight pack to show more often. This is how you do it. Kind of look at it as in a portfolio. And then you don't want to focus, although PLAs have them, you can see search queries within the AdWords interface. I'll show you why those are crap later. But this portfolio approach is the best way to do it. Then, when you want to get fancy, you can layer your bids. So layering bids means that you can have any single product appear in multiple portfolios and then bid differently for each of those portfolios. So let's say I have a sweatshirt, and it is categorized in the activewear column. And then it's also a certain brand, and it's in a 50% off sale. 
So that means that that particular sweatshirt can show up in three different product portfolios at any given time. So I want to make sure that I structure my bids appropriately as to what portfolio is more important to me versus less. And so you can see how this can get really messy really fast if you had three million products. So another thing that's not always known about PLAs is that there are negative keywords. So you can use negative keywords in the same way that you can use them in search text ads, but you want to make sure is that you don't go crazy with them. So negative keywords in the context of Google Shopping restricts traffic. It actually just stops it. it. It says to Google, we are not relevant for these things, go away. Whereas most people guess that instead it tries to find another product or something else that's similar that it could show for it, it doesn't. If you put in a negative keyword that says, you know, for like porcelain because you only sell things made out of granite or whatever, then it's gonna anything, any query around porcelain, it's not gonna go through. So don't go crazy when you do this, especially because a lot of folks only do one Google Shopping campaign, and then they'll put the negative keywords in at the top level and not realize how much traffic they're restricting underneath. Okay, there we go. All right, let's get weird. All right, also, I just really like this scene. So as I was talking about, there are entire companies that have built an empire on Google Shopping. They're very happy about the change to, uh, to paid. And what these companies do is they really, more than anything, they help you get over that technical difficulties thing. So you can actually export a feed that looks like raw hamburger and give it to these guys and they will turn it into steak. Um, they also, they'll charge you for it too. And that's kind of what you have to consider when you go to do Google Shopping is how much money do you have to invest in this endeavor? Some of them are flat fee, some of them are percentage of spend, and some of them are percentage of revenue. So it depends entirely on how much you're willing to give up in order to have these guys clean up your feed for you. But they can also do some other really cool things, like setting floors and ceilings and bidding to margin. So setting a floor. If you have a products, let's say you have 300 SKUs, but at the end of the day you look at it and you go, okay, really we should only be sending about 80,000. You can have these platforms program it in and give it rules that say, all right, any product that's under $9.99, don't send to Google Shopping. I don't want to pay for those clicks. And this is something you should do. You should not send every single product you've ever made in your life to Google Shopping. Same thing is with ceilings. If you have a product that's just for fun or kind of a joke, when I got married, my husband wanted to register for the Martin Jetpack, which he did. Uh, we didn't get it, but I'm sure whoever was advertising it enjoyed the clicks that he had on it in the shopping interface. The other thing is margins. So maybe you have products that are really good margin for you, maybe they don't. You can actually just go into these systems and say, all right, if there is less than 5% margin on these products, don't send it. Or bid it down to like five cents, because I don't want it unless I can get it super cheap. Otherwise, you're spending on a per-click basis more than you would have, uh, than, you, than you should, honestly, or than the cost of the actual product itself. One thing that came up while I was doing this presentation is whether or not schema.org affects product listing ads. And it kind of was going to before 2012 in October, and then once it went ahead and went all database feed managed, was it. So it doesn't really. This is something that is near and dear to me that I would like to see more people do, which is image testing in using in, use image testing in product listing ads. So if you have a really strong affiliate program or you have what's called the Amazon problem where you got really strong on Amazon for your products and now Amazon is taking all your traffic, this is how you, do, this is how you stand out in the crowd. Have a folder on your server of unique images just for product listing ads. Serve those images through your feed and then you can stand out in the crowd and you don't have the same picture as everybody else. Now you can't do, um, here we go, you can't do text on the pictures, nice try, somebody already tried that. You can't put like your 30% off or your promotions on it, just, just the images. Catalog submission, so a lot of you folks already know about this, or if you didn't, surprise, catalog submission. You can go ahead and submit this, and why not, if you have a, if you have a physical catalog. Um, it's not shown right now to be linked to Google Shopping, but you really, can you really tell me that it's not going to be? I mean, come on. Oh, Bing. Bing, they decided to do product ads too. So in, October, in March of this year, they launched theirs. Only they don't call them product listing ads, they call them product ads. 
So it works almost exactly the same. They made it stupid easy to get into. It mimics Google almost exactly. Same required attributes, same kind of feed load up, um, upload, same kind of editorial guidelines, same structure within the Bing Ads interface. The trick is they actually beat Google to the punch on this. They didn't make a separate merchant center the way that Google did. They nested it in Bing Ads. So all you have to do is go into the Bing Ads platform and go into Merchant Center to get started. However, I would recommend not going crazy and doing all the crazy and uh, doing all the layering and the targeting the attributes because what we're seeing on average right now is 4% of Google PLA traffic or 20. It's, it, there's, like no, there's no in between. It's either 4 or 20. And I asked a whole bunch of my friends in the industry about this and said, are you guys seeing the same thing? So it's either a very small piece or it's a big healthy piece depending on what vertical you're in. This, I don't know if everybody knows about this one. This was Bing Ads Rich Captions. So this allows you to go into the Bing Ads interface. You can upload the product feed, click the box for rich captions, and then this is what's going to show in the organic search results on Bing.com. So if you don't want to do Bing product ads and you don't want to do Google Shopping, you can still utilize that feed that's sitting around and have it come in and do price and availability. However, it will get attributed to Google or I mean sorry, it will get attributed to Bing organic traffic in your analytics platform. They have no way to track it yet separately. They're still working on that, and there's not a whole lot of movement on uh, if they're gonna make any more improvements to it. It's just there for if you want it for free for now. Okay. No mall presentation is complete without a fat guy on a segue, right? How did this move even get made? All right. Google Analytics, come on, dashboards are your friends, even Marshall said it, dashboards are cool. So, but what isn't a no-brainer is tracking the difference between your search text ads and your PLA traffic, and you should definitely, definitely track between the two. So, we have a toy, Oh, and it broke a little bit, but that's okay. So, Google Analytics PLA dashboard. This is free, this was created at Portent by our analytics architect, Michael Wiegan. This is in the Bitly bundle and it's on our blog, go ahead, Get it, grab the link, install it in your analytics platform. Just make sure that you named your campaign something similar, like sh with the word shopping in it, or PLA, instead of like Rand's suggestion of you guys are dicks. So this will work, and it'll just plug in and off you go. Okay, Marshall also brought this up, Supermetrics. If both of us giving this, this uh, particular tool and endorsement doesn't do it for you, I don't know what else you need, but Supermetrics is awesome. So I use it for two things. One is the import third-party cost data tool. So if you've ever wanted to import your cost data for Bing, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you're doing, this is how you do it. And then you can make super cool reports like Data Grabber from Excel. So that's two endorsements for Supermetrics right there. And I have an endorsement for the same thing, actually, is Splunk. So doing log file analysis. And it turns out, and I talked to the folks at Splunk, and I said, do people actually use your, your product for what I'm doing, which is looking for comparison shoppers? And they said, actually, they do. They, have, they found a couple of folks that were doing that. And what it is is Google does this really cool thing where if somebody clicks on your ad multiple times and goes to your site back and forth and opens multiple tabs, they just charge you as it's a new auction every single time. So you don't get a discount or anything. They just keep charging you. So comparison shoppers is a real thing, and this is how you would actually find them is through log file management. I'm sorry, log file analysis. And the reason that comparison shoppers are something you want to take a look at is you want to see how much is the true cost of Google shopping to you because People are weird. People like my mom. There we go. My mom has no idea that she's clicking on an ad in Google Shopping. And while Google Shopping has done a beautiful job of making these comparison shopping grids and indexes for you to, to scroll through, people open multiple tabs. They just do it. I asked my mom once how she gets to, uh, I asked her, what browser do you use? And she said, the internet. I said, OK. All right, you're on Internet Explorer. Got it. All right. Assisted conversions, these are important. You want to make sure that you count these, especially in product listing ads, because what we've noticed in particular across the industry is, these, is PLAs are not all about last click. Again, comparison shoppers kind of thing. They come in, they look around, they come back direct, maybe they come back organic, who knows? But make sure that if you're not, doing, if you're not considering assisted conversions already in your PLA efforts, that you do. Okay, check out. All right, these are some things that, I'm gonna, that I feel that are going to be important in the context of Google Shopping in the future. So reviews, and we've talked about this a little bit already at the conference. These are important. Um, Third-party reviews. Pick a, pick a platform that Google scrapes, like BizRate or Reseller Ratings. Don't be the guy with no rating. 
people listen to strangers more than any and than any before. They read reviews, they, they trust them, they look at them. And when you go into sh and when you go into the fierce competition now that is Google Shopping, you're going to need to be able to be part of the group. So search queries. As I was saying in AdWords, you can see search queries from product listing ads, but they're not everything they shake out to be. So in this case, we was able to determine that one is a person and one is not a person. And here's what's happening. So that query is very, very specific. I mean, that is a product name, it is a description, and it is a style number. Think of all the times that you've, you've searched like that versus all the times that you haven't searched like that. And it turns out what that is, if you look at the third listing down, is that is a product title. That is a product page on Amazon. And what is happening is these are, these are showing up as PLA impressions, but they're actually on the Google Search Partner Network. So Kohl's is a prime, prime uh, violator of this. And they have tons of ads on their site. You'd think they would not want to do this because they're selling things on their site. But no, they have massive amounts of Google ads on their site. And they are getting racked up as partner impressions. So if you'd like to dig in more of this, because it's pretty nerdy, there is a presentation that I've linked to in the Bitly link bundle that was given at PPC Hero Conference this year that goes into it in great detail. OK. Why would I even do this, right? Why would I even do Google Shopping besides obviously desperately needing a hobby? Well, it's the, it's the advertising platform that's also a search engine. You get so many things. It's, the, it's Google's game, right? Google has Google. It's their game. It's their shopping engine. And if you want to play, you have to pay. And they really, really like money. Um, the nice thing is that PLA CPCs at this time, or cost per clicks, are actually lower than search text ads on average. Search text ads, I go in, and I, my favorite that I've seen personally was $122 a click. Second DUI attorney in Los Angeles. So if you're a DUI attorney in Los Angeles, it's a pretty heavy investment. But for product listing ads, it's like $5 and under, what we're seeing on average. So it's still cheap to get into. I'm waiting for the $122 day. I think the record now is $204 for mesothelioma attorney. But it's their game. And if you want to play, you have to pay. Uh, to give you an idea of how important some, some industries know this to be, in October of 2012, when they went to paid, Etsy, the craft vendor marketplace, told all of their vendors, we will pay for your PLA, PLA clicks this holiday season. So Etsy made the investment, did all the shopping feeds, and paid $250,000 out of their pocket to keep all of their vendors in the game knowing that it would have resulted in tons of lost business and confusion. I mean, can you imagine all the crafters and knitters and, and potters trying to figure out how to do PLAs? Etsy just said, you know what, we'll take care of it for you. They knew how important it was for their folks to be in this space, especially with such short notice in October of 2012. OK, so there's a lot of information here. So who should you listen to? Really, you want to follow the money. Turns out that, paid, uh, that uh, in PPC, we are huge nerds, too. Don't think you have a corner on the nerd market, OK? We are huge freaking nerds. So here are the three companies that I recommend taking a look at if you want to keep on, on top of the industry, but kind of more of a 30,000 foot view. Let's say you don't want to get that nerdy. So RKG or Rim Kaufman, they handle the most PLA spend in the entire United States. Every white paper, blog post, and quarterly report they do is paid nerd heaven. WordStream also handles millions of dollars through their platform. And they are mostly for SMBs. But every time Google rolls out a new feature, you can count on them to go through and rip it apart. And then Marin Software actually does a really good quarterly report. But it is the most aggressive marketing team I've ever dealt with. So if you've got a PPC person in-house, have them do it first. Don't give them your name. They'll call you every week. But they have lots of money, and they know what they're doing. And then I work at Port, and I kind of know what I'm doing. I don't have millions of dollars, but, and I don't have any cat memes. I'm really sorry about that. But I do kind of know what's going on. So last but not least, I'm going to show you this one more time, which is my bit.ly.com, my, my link bundle, if you want to go through. Every link that I talked about is in there. It's from Tagman to Splunk to Etsy, you name it. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of information. Uh, I think anybody who's interested is going to have to download your slide deck and I that am link bundle. Come find me. Let's nerd out.
Uh, we don't have time for Q&A, but there's two big takeaways I got from that. One, there, there seems to be plenty of opportunity uh, in Google. It's still in its infancy. Um, and second, I, you're the second or third speaker today to mention site speed. Uh, and I think uh, when working with clients, you must see multiple advantages that everything's intertwined. Exactly. And I mean, we all know that. I mean, there's no need to, to beat a dead horse at site speed. You don't, you, when you go shopping, you don't want to sit there and watch for to load either. So why would anyone else? Oh, that horse isn't dead yet. We're going to keep beating okay. that. Yeah. All right. Elizabeth Marston, everybody. Thank you.